Next, we're going to uh, have a debate on uh, hemi versus total hip arthroplasty for displaced femoral neck fractures in the elderly. Um, I think we need to do the voting. Okay. It's probably worth saying to finish the last talk that what in 2000, when inter the, the, the nails were introduced for this purpose, it was 80-20 hip screws. By 2001, it was 80-20 nails. And the reason for that switch was reimbursement. So it was always driven by, the, by cost. I mean, over time, there's a lot of clinical reasons to pick one or the other, but that literal flip was not because the hip screw stopped working. It was all about money then, just like it's all about money and everything. Well, they, they normalize that cost yeah, differential now. But it, okay, uh, we have a case of a displaced femoral neck. 75-year-old um, female, ground-level fall, isolated injury. Uh, a few um, comorbidities, uh, and she is a community ambulator, retired and lives with her husband. So uh, first we have uh, Dr. Brady, who's going to talk about hemiarthroplasty. All right, so no matter where you work, whether you're working in a level one trauma center or a community hospital with no trauma designation or you know, in a major city or not in a major city, we're gonna see this uh, fracture. Uh, they're very common, we need to know what to do with them. So we know clearly this is a surgical indication. So. Uh, displaced femoral neck fractures, unless there is a contraindication for surgery, get surgery. So why should we do a hemiarthroplasty in this particular patient? So we look at our x-rays, and at least when I was a resident, we were always told to ask people, and I never saw a total hip for a, for a, a femoral neck fracture as a resident. We did hemis all the time anyway, but we were always told, told to ask the patients, well, did you have pre-existing groin pain before you came and broke your hip? And whether they said yes or no, we did a hemi on them. But uh, look at this. Um, the astabin looks okay. There's no osteophytes. There's no significant narrowing. Why would we subject this person to a, uh, a procedure that takes out normal anatomy? Why should we do hemiarthroplasty? Because it's, it's a universally accepted treatment. Everybody in their residency program has done a hemiarthroplasty. It's an approach, whether you do lateral approach or direct lateral or anterolateral or posterior approach, it's an approach that everyone knows well. You've seen it a thousand times before you've finished your residency program, uh, so you know how to do it. And you don't have to worry about trying to expose the acetabulum and causing other problems and getting medialization of your, of your acetabulum and you know penetrating into your bladder. It can be done quickly, so this can be done Monday morning, first case starter, this can be done on you know, Sunday evening when it comes in because everybody knows the approach. And we know that there's an advantage to getting surgery for femoral neck fractures or hip fractures in general done early. We know that complications increase with surgery that's done after 24 hours. And there are some studies coming out recently that show that we might even wanna push this to try and get surgery done within 12 hours of this patient hitting the ER. Um, studies have shown that there's an increased mortality, an increased length of stay, and an increase in medical complications if we delay surgery past 24 hours. Hemis generally have a lower risk of dislocation than total hip replacements because of the large head sizes that we're able to use with hemiarthroplasty. I think you may get some pushback from the total joint surgeons who say, you know, if I repair the capsule or if I do an anterior approach or with meticulous technique, I can decrease my dislocation risk, but those are people who do hip replacements for a living. That's all they do. Um, so if you do something over and over again, then yes, I think your complication rate is definitely going to be lower. Uh, however, not everybody who's going to be taking trauma call uh, or community hip fracture call is a total joint surgeon. Uh, and we know that with hemiarthroplasties, our dislocation rate is less. Um, we know that in just general, hip fractures are not necessarily always the problem. They're, the hip fractures may be 
a sequelae of an underlying problem. Sick people fall down and break their hips. They have cancer, they have dementia, they have coronary artery disease, and at uh, a year, up to 20 to 30 percent of these patients are going to be no longer with us. Uh, so with those type of numbers, it may be better, or it may not be cost effective, not that you want to put a, a cost uh, number on a life, but it may not be cost effective to do a, a higher uh, cost surgery on a patient who has a limited life expectancy. Um, we know that the, the, one of the reasons to think about why we would do a hip, uh, a total hip replacement uh, for hip fractures, because we're worried about uh, acetabular erosion and need for further revision surgery to, to convert that. However, there's a low incidence of conversion rates for hemiarthroplasty, a total hip arthroplasties, because of acetabular erosion. And this recent study out of the Journal of Arthroplasty shows that for uh, patients under 75 uh, years old, the conversion rate because of acetabular erosion and acetabular pain to total hip replacement is only about 2.5%. And if you go with the patients who are over 75, which is who our patient is, um, your conversion rate is only about 1.4%. Uh, and that's an average time of conversion at 1.9 years. We know that good to excellent results can be done with, uh, with when total hips are done by arthroplasty surgeons, but as I said before, most of these fractures are not going to be done by the arthroplasty surgeons. There's a very good uh, review article in uh, the British Medical Journal uh, about where the cutoff point is. I think this won a resident uh, research award a few years ago uh, about where the cutoff point is in terms of surgeon volume. We know that if you don't do a lot of a certain surgery, your outcomes are not going to be very good. Uh, so if you, and that cutoff for uh, hip replacement surgeries tends to be about 35 cases per year. So if you're in my hospital, we do about 300 to 350 hip fractures uh, per year. Um, and we divide that up by about eight or nine surgeons who are taking call. Um, that's right about the cutoff of about 35 cases per year. And not everybody's doing arthroplasty. Um, so hemiarthroplasty, people can do, uh, or, or surgeons know how to do. Uh, with less complications. However, if you're not an arthroplasty surgeon, doing the totals may not be the right thing to do. And we know the arthroplasty surgeons operate on Tuesdays and Thursdays. They don't operate on Friday. They're out playing golf. They're wearing nice clothes, and they get all their cases done by 2 o'clock. So it's probably not worthwhile to have that person wait for the arthroplasty surgeon in order to get their surgery done. So hemiarthroplasty is a gold standard option for the displaced femoral neck fractures. It's surgery that can be done by anybody, or it should be able to be done by anyone who's uh, graduated from a competent orthopedic residency program. You get immediate mobility and pain control, and there's no need to wait for a subspecialist. Our concerns about having to convert these to total hip arthroplasties later on may be unfounded. Thank you. All right, next we'll have Dr. Jack Schilling from uh, Cooper talk about total hip arthroplasty. So the beauty of this talk is that I agree with Drew. And I think, you know, I, I was asked to, to do this partly because I'm, I'm probably one of the last, I won't say the only, because there's others, but in this, in the city, uh, joint surgeons that still take trauma call. And so Sock was kind enough to, and, and Mash were kind enough to throw, throw my hat into the ring for this. The, the interesting part of it is that when I, when I really talk about um, what we ought to do with these, I, I, I've debated this. This seems like such an easy conversation. But in the grand scheme of things, my job today is not to turn everybody into total hip surgeons on the weekend or at night for these in these cases because so much of what Drew said, frankly, I believe in. Um, you know, this is a particular case, a 76-year-old female, and, and, and when we were talking about what to do for this case, you know, and we were trying to use certain parameters, somebody between 70 and 75, something to make it controversial because if a 50-year-old breaks their hip in a car accident, you're going to do a total hip on them, and if, and if a 90-year-old breaks their hip, you're probably going to do a hemi on them. And it's, I mean, so we were trying to take some of the outliers out of the conversation. So, you know, 76-year-old female, displaced femoral neck fracture, fall from a standing height, um, mild, minimal preoperative hip pain, um, community ambulator without an assistive device, healthy, lives alone with no evidence for dementia. So these, I mean, 
going back to just the idea of what questions to ask and what to understand, because you're making decisions relatively quickly, um, my decision about considering a total hip comes down to, if I'm, if I'm looking purely at patient factors, <clears throat> so much of it is age, so much, so much of it is activity, so much of it is comorbid conditions. Um, a huge believer in um, a clear mind makes a better patient, and uh, people, I mean, it, it, hip fractures and dementia, it's a bad combination because they just can't fight for themselves. So people who, and I, and I tell every patient, hip, uh, hip fracture patient, whether I'm considering a hemi or a total, look, if you were a community ambulator, you may be with a cane. You know, you just have to be prepared for the changes in your life that are coming. The mortality rates of hip fracture surgery, depending on who you read, even in 2018, it's six months. It's, it's a bigger number than you think when, it, when it's all comers. So, so, you know, you've got to make a lot of important decisions really quickly in the, in the process. So you can do this, which is a cemented hemiarthroplasty, and I threw cement in there because even though that's not what I'm talking about, I'm a pretty big proponent in a hip fracture population that you really ought to consider doing cemented cases um, when you have the opportunity. I mean, the bone quality here looks okay on the x-ray. On this particular case, I didn't love that, but I, I threw that in there just as sort of the either or, but both of these cases are, are gonna be cemented. Or, or you can do this, which is what we did in, in the case in question, which was a cemented total hip. Um, I ended up choosing to do a total hip based on that lady that was laying in front of me in conversations with family and conversations with her about what she was doing and what her expectations were and how she was before and bone quality and what did her acetabulum look, at, look like at that time. And, and in the end, I also chose to do it because I do this all week. You know, and in this case, we happened to do on a Saturday and I didn't have the perfect team, but I felt comfortable that I could get through the case and make sure that the cup was in the right place and all those things on my own. But, but part of it is, going back to what Drew was saying at the end, I mean, <laughs> it is about your own specific comfort level with what you're, what you're trying to address. And you have to be honest with yourself about the situation. The patient, yourself, uh, the conditions in the operating room, I mean, it, 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 seven o'clock on a Sunday night, if you've done five total <laughs> hips this year, is probably not the right time to choose that. And that might be a reason to wait a day um, but, you know, it's it, it just, these are, the, these are the things to think about. It is about the x-ray, it is about the patient and what their functional status is, but it's about a lot of other things too when you're making this kind of a decision because in the end, Hemi's pretty bulletproof. So you, you better have a really good reason to do this and be really confident that you're gonna do a better job with a total than a Hemi. Um, so again, most get Hemi arthroplasty and I mean, the, the, the Journal of Trauma 2014, uh, Hockfelder, <coughs> this was a New York State-based study, uh, Perry, uh, a British national study. But basically, for displaced femoral neck fractures in 2014, 33,000 patients, 7% got totals. And in, uh, and in uh, uh, Europe, uh, Great Britain, British Medical Journal, 110,000 patients, 10% got a total. So I mean, Hemiarthroplasty is the gold standard, as Drew said. It is the right, it is the answer most of the time. Um, so when do you choose the others? And when, uh, when do you choose total hip versus hemiarthroplasty? Well, you know, I pulled a couple of articles that some of them say exactly the same thing. Frankly, a lot of the articles say the same thing. Um, and the two top studies, both large meta-analysis studies that basically say that if you do total hips, your dislocation rate is probably gonna be a little bit higher, but you're gonna have an overall lower reoperation rate, and in the end, if you pick the right people, higher functional scores. But you've just gotta be careful when you're looking at these because it's, there's so much age bias and function bias. There's so much soft to these studies when you really look at the materials and methods about choosing um, who is going to be the ideal candidate for a total versus a hemi. So you're making a lot of decisions in a really small period of time. And you know we were talking about this upstairs. I mean, you've got five minutes to meet these people a lot of times and make a whole lot of value judgments. Um, the, uh, the U article from CORE in 2012 was just one of the, the best studies. Uh, it was a China stu Chinese study, but it was still one of the best studies that, that, that showed those three things, Incre increased dislocation rate, lower reoperation rate, and higher functional scores. Um, 
There is a study that came out as recently as uh, last fall from the Netherlands in JBJS that basically showed that at 12 years in the 70 and over population, cemented total hip versus cemented hemi had no functional difference at, at 12 years. So the argument that you're going to have issue with cartilage pain and functional, issue, uh, functional pain moving forward, um, I put that in there because it actually works against what I'm supposed to be supporting. But I think the point is, is that as someone who is a joint surgeon, you know, I, I feel like I'm the alien in this room a little bit, but I, I, the, the benefit of being the joint surgeon is that when, stu when these things fail, I, they come to me to fix. And what I will tell you, and I don't like the school of anecdotal medicine, but I, 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 there, there are not a lot of studies about high conversion rates, as Drew pointed out on one of his slides, from hemi to total. And I, in 19 years, I haven't seen a lot of that either in my own population or things referred into me. So I think HEMI is a fairly bulletproof thing. Um, I also love, there's, a, there's an article that literally just came out in the April 2018 issue of CORE um, by Dr. Bernstein at Penn. And he talks about um, what he called the Bandari paradox of HEMI versus total in this situation. And there's basically three things that he attributed the reason for there being 90 to 95% hemiarthroplasty versus total hip arthroplasty in this population. Um, it was a psychological study where if you talk to patients ahead of time and said, would you rather have a total or would you rather have a hemi, they all think that they want a total. 90% said, I think a total's better for me without having, and these were people that didn't have a fracture and were laying there. You were just talking about the concept, but yet the actual numbers are the flip. And so the concept, uh, the, you know, there were three things that he talked about in, his, in the article, and, and one was that it's a really difficult decision to make because of all these different variables that we just got done talking about. Um, you're making a lot of big, small, a lot of big decisions, but very small decisions in a short period of time. Um, the other is that the economics of total hip in this situation aren't really supported. It's a more complicated pr a procedure with potential complications, but yet you don't really get much more money for it. So people are a little bit nervous about, uh, about pursuing that. And then the last is that we all think about things in, in sort of a biphasic mode where in the very beginning you make an emotional quick decision and then if you think about it for a little while you make a slower, more deliberate decision and sometimes those decisions aren't the same. Um, and our emotional decision is you're on call, you're trying to get work done and the HEMI is the easier answer and it's the more predictable answer in most people's hands. So for that reason, we offer that when even if there might be a reason why total hip was the right answer, you're trying to make a, make a process a whole bunch of different details at the same time rather than wait because we do know that whether we talk about 24 hours or 12 hours or 48 hours, personally I'm a 24 to 36 hour. I think, I think you optimize hip fracture patients. They are not a 20 year old tibia fracture. A lot of them are dehydrated. They come up with a million problems. Take 24 hours and get them tuned up and then get them done and get them done right. That's a separate conversation. But if you make those decisions in 24 hours, oftentimes the right most predictable answer in most people's hands because you don't have total joint arthroplasty surgeons on call to do this stuff 24 hours a day is to do the hemiarthroplasty. So what's the right answer? I think the right answer is careful patient selection try to avoid the paradox and make a careful decision in a short period of time. Know your own limitations as a surgeon and as a hospital and as a team on that day as you're entering the room and always cement. Over 70. Thanks. We'll do the post-debate survey. Okay, it still looks like hemiarthroplasty is the uh, victor here. So I think that uh, concludes our debate session for uh, hip fractures. If you can please leave your uh, audio, uh, audience response uh, system keypads 